in the program because obviously we are able to use them. Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday, October 12th, 2021 select board meeting is um, all of the selectmen are here, either here or on Zoom. We have the town manager, the town clerk, the athletic director or recreation director, <laughs> I should say. Um, we have the chair of the recreation commission and we have visitors from Tom Irwin. Is, uh, please stand with me and salute the flag. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, first order is the approval of our minutes from September 28th. I move that we accept the minutes as presented. Okay. Is there any discussion? If not, I'll go through the rolls. Is Mark? Yes. Sir. Noah? Yes. Linda? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a yes. Thank you. Before I forget to sign it, I have Patty come yell at me again. <laughs> Um, our first public comment is, uh, I do not believe we have any public comment is, but I am going to take this opportunity to do a public comment is it's been brought to my attention recently about a lot of, uh, things happening on social media concerning the town is, uh, two things I want to address tonight is property taxes is I paid my taxes this morning. Hopefully everybody else did also. So at least by this morning, I don't like paying taxes, but I like getting the services that come with it. A lot of people are complaining about, we need to cut this. We need to cut that. And my question to the people will be, where do you want to cut? You want to cut the fire department? They responded to over 900 calls last year. Whose house don't you want them to come to? Whose medical issue don't you want them in the police responded to over 9,000 calls who do you want them to stop seeing do you want them to stop coming to investigate burglaries we have 37 miles of roads whose road do we stop plowing whose road do we stop patching you know these are the things that we need to think about you get services for what you pay for and if those services are good then the pay you what you pay for them should equal that. And I think it does. Do you want to cut the town employees? We already get complaints that the office is only open four days a week. We could cut the employees and open three days a week. Is that what people want? And remember, less than half of your tax bill goes to pay for the town. More than half goes to the school and the county. So when you start thinking about are complaining about paying your taxes, come to me, tell me where you want to cut and I'll listen to you. The other thing is that there's been a lot of attacks on the planning board lately. You know, people are upset because there's been a lot of subdivisions proposed. A lot of people are upset that the schools are growing, but it's become personal as when you start attacking the volunteers, we have a hard time filling these positions is we beg people to volunteer their time to do this. Most of these people I hear or see complaining on social media, I have never heard from them. I have never seen them. I don't know who they are because they're not involved. They wanna sit at their home with a nice frosty one or whatever and type out some hateful things. These are all volunteers. The selectmen get paid. I get a thousand dollars. Ooh, and you guys get what eight hundred? You know, so if you guys want to, you know, get rid of me, you can vote me out. You know, I've been voted in three times now. Well, actually four back in the nineties. Is uh, you know, so obviously somebody likes what I'm doing. And if you don't like what's going on in the planning board, and if you don't like what's going on, and you think there's too many subdivisions, 
there's a perfect opportunity on Thursday. Mm -hmm. We're having the comprehensive plan meeting. And if anybody wants to be involved in what they want Berwick to look like, contact James and he'll give you the Zoom link and you can come to our meeting. And that's where we plan, and I mean we as the town, plan what we think Berwick should be in the next 10 years. So if you want to attack me, come at me. I don't care. I grew up with eight brothers and sisters. I'm used to being beat up. I don't care. So, but that's my soapbox for today. Like I said, I've been, my attention was brought to it over the weekend and I spent way too many hours going over the Facebook pages and I felt that I needed to come to the defense of the town. So that's my public comment. Thank you, John. <sighs> Public hearing, we have none. We have no reports of committees. I don't see Jeremy up there. No. Department reports. And this brings us to our presentation. And we have the feasibility study for the Recreation Commission done by Tom Irwin Incorporated. And today we have Ian to help bring us through it. And I have to tell you, is most of the board has not had a chance to really look at this in detail. So yep. is we will be coming back later date with more questions, I'm sure. So Absolutely, yes. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen if that's okay. For, <coughs> you try. For the, <laughs> I will try. Yeah. Uh, hopefully this will work. There we go. Okay, just about there, excuse me for one second. How does that look to everybody? I can see it. Yep, everybody on Zoom can see that okay? Yeah, we're good here, thank you. Good, great, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Tom, um, for that uh, kind introduction. I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Scott Vos, um, our technical advisor at Tom Irwin. Um, Scott did an awful lot of the um, existing conditions work uh, and analysis that we carried out. So I'll hand over to Scott a little bit through this presentation so that he can give us an update and give you an update in, into some of the work that he carried out as part of this study. Um, yeah, just going back in time, just a quick introduction. Um, so basically we met with Angela and James, uh, ironically on Zoom, um, and we discussed the potential of carrying out a feasibility study. James and, and, and Angela had, had expressed an interest in understanding um, and wanting to look at the possible redevelopment of Memorial Park, uh, sorry, Memorial Field. I've got Memorial Park in my brain. And from that, um, we, we had sort of said to, to James and Angela that we've carried out a number of feasibility studies for municipals, for cities, for towns throughout New England. And that this would be something that we felt we could, um, we could help the town with and help James and Angela with. And I think one of the stimuluses for the feasibility study was the potential new development across the road from here. And that the fact that that would um, increase, um, you know, not only the, um, the, the number of citizens in the town, but also their need to use, um, you know, Memorial Field as a facility, um, whether it be for sport, whether it be for recreation. Um, so that was a big part of, um, the reason that we were successfully, thankfully hired. And, um, and then we set about our work. So um, if I just sort of talk you through um, a little bit of that. Oh, why won't this go forward? Okay. So I just wanted to, just before we get into the actual mechanics of the, of the, of the study, just wanted to talk a little bit about what, believe, what we believe at Tom Irwin. Um, uh, as it says really on the slide, we believe in outdoor recreation and green spaces, that they're essential to life in our community uh, and well-being. 
and um, athletic fields and parks are, you, you know, so highly valued and cherished. Um, and I think that that was very evident with Memorial Field. Um, I remember saying to James and Angela at the time that it's very unusual to have a facility of that nature very, very close to your town centre. Um, and it's in most cases an advantage because usually those facilities are held uh, or, or located, you know, on the outskirts of, um, of, your, of a town. So to have it sort of almost as part of the hub of the town centre, I, I thought was really cool, actually. And, and I've not seen that in very many facilities that I've visited in towns and, and cities over the last seven years in New England. Um, so obviously, you know, we believe that that. Um, you, you know, green spaces, facilities generally are, are, are you know, a cherished um, thing and we should do everything we can to protect them, maintain them, improve them and develop them. Um, so again, um, with that in mind, we look at any project that we undertake with the, you know, the sustainability triangle, as we call it, in mind. Um, we may not be designing something, we may be at the maintenance stage, but we still want to make sure that we take into account the environment as a whole um, and how that can be affected both, both positively and negatively through um, our work. Um, the economics, obviously, that's that's really close to our heart as well. Understanding that, you know, there aren't vast budgets around and just hearing what Tom was, you know, eloquently saying earlier about taxes, um, you know, really makes that point. And then probably the most important, as I would see it, are the people um, and how they would like to use that facility. Would they like to use that facility? Um, I remember growing up and, and having a park not far from where I lived. And I spent some wonderful, you know, what, my wonderful childhood there. So I know how important that that part of, of a green space can be. So we, when we look at this from Tom Owen's perspective, this, this is what we're looking at. We approach every project in this way and we keep these things as our guiding lights to make sure that when we actually um, present findings, reports um, and carry out our work that we've done it, you know, with, with the diligence in mind that, that keeps everything as sustainable um, as possible. I'd just like to quickly introduce you to my team. Um, so you, you all know me now. Um, uh, for those of you who have not met me, I'm Ian Lacey, the, the lead project advisor. We also have Kevin Dufour, who is our environment and sustainability advisor. Um, and we have Jack Schmidgall, who is our design and construction advisor. And then we have Scott. Um, and by no means, because he's at the bottom of that, that list, does it make him any less important um, to our team? Um, we have Scott as our technical advisor. So he's saying that because you're sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's going to hit me if I say something different. So um, so that's the team. So what was the scope of the feasibility study? We actually ended up breaking it down into three particular um, facets. The first was the existing conditions analysis. So that is where we use our performance quality standards. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And Scott will talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, but that's a way in which we evaluate an athletic field um, or green space. Then we also looked at the soil investigation and evaluations. Um, at the end of the day, when you're growing grass, you're a farmer. Um, it's a crop. And we want to make sure, like any farmer would, that the soils are correct. And if the soils are good, then we generally would have a good crop. So we might not be eating this crop, but we're certainly going to be using it. So we want to make sure that, um, that we have our soils in balance uh, and so on. Then the next really important thing is making sure that we can give them life, give our, our turf life through irrigation. So we carried out an, an audit and an inspection. We also looked at the drainage evaluation, because as much as we want good soils, we want to make sure that those soils are able to hold on to some moisture, but also let some moisture through. So we don't end up with fields that you can't play on and are too wet. And, uh, you know, we've certainly found that out to, to uh, our detriment this year, you know, throughout New England and throughout, you know, the, the East Coast of America for sure, uh, with all of the conditions we've had. 
And then finally, in that section, we did an infield play investigation. Uh, we appreciate how important baseball is to the town and to that facility. And it's one of the most important things that helps baseball, you know, perform is the infield play. And um, so we did an investigation of that and an evaluation of that. We then moved on once we had that information and we looked at how do we support the field infrastructure? So we look then at a labor analysis and that's where we look at how uh, are the fields potentially being looked after? How are the fields being maintained, um, scheduled? All of those things that would, would really come under Angela's remit as the recreation director and parks director. We also looked at a usage analysis and, and that helps us understand um, why we might see certain conditions on the fields um, when we did our analysis in the earlier stages. So we're trying then, we have a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle that we're now trying to put together. And we don't necessarily have the picture of the box, but we're just trying to fit the pieces together. So, so we need to do this analysis and evaluation in, in all of these areas to help us do that. We did a general green space analysis and an evaluation. And what we're looking at there is what about the areas where we're not using uh, for sport? What, how can we use them and how are they being used for general recreation for just to allow, for instance, people to walk around the park, uh, to walk around the fields um, without actually playing sport. Um, uh, so we looked at that. And then lastly, in this study, we broke it down into what we call the concept study section, which is really where we look at what we call concepts, visions and values. And, and I know that you have the reports and there's far more information in the reports than I'm going to present tonight, but, um, but that became a really important part. Most of you at one stage or another were, were able um, to be interviewed by myself. So I did a range of interviews over a six to eight week period in the end. Um, and that taught us some really, really good things. Um, and to say very quickly about the interviews, it, it wasn't all moans and groans. There was a lot of really good information that people provided to us, uh, really good insight that, that obviously really help us understand how to help you best um, through our process. Um, we then looked at having all of this information together and having this jigsaw puzzle that we can now start to fit together. What would those solutions be? And what kind of budget would you require for those solutions? And um, and lastly, then, it was the concept evaluation. So once we had all of this information, what were we then, what were we then going to say to you as a town? This is how to do this. This is how to do that. We see this as a possible future. Um, so we put together, which I know you can see one of them up here on the, on the, um, on the white, on the, on uh, the, Whatever that thing's called, I've forgotten the name of it. Ethan. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, um, it's. I'll just blame that on being English. Um, but uh, yeah, whatever that thing is, we we've got some plans on there that we'll show you a little bit later. So that was the scope of the study. So, what does Memorial Field look like then? So what we did is um, we looked at an aerial view of the facility and then looked at how we would break it down so that we could manage it a little bit easier when we're carrying out our evaluation. So rather than just walking on the facility and you know not really having a plan of where to start, we thought it would be good to name everything so then it's easier to follow in the recommendations and the reports, but it's also easy for Scott and I to follow um, with the team when we're pulling together all of the information. So that's how we categorized it um, and that was with the help of Angela and, and uh, some other um, people that uh, James and, and other people that we met through, you know, through our conversations. So we were able to bring it down to something relatively simple when you look at it on the slide. Um, but that enabled us then to really dissect um, each part of this facility and understand um, you know, what was making that facility work or not work or somewhere in between that. So part of Scott's work, and I'm going to hand over to him very shortly, was to basically carry out a sampling strategy. 
So once we identified um, the components of the facility, uh, each individual field, if you like, or area, then um, we left the, the next phase of this up to Scott. And that's where he excels. That's where he came in and diligently over um, you know, many days, he spent time um, digging test pits, as we call them, excavating test, pit, test pits. Um, and he'll show you some slides in a minute on that. And also doing lots of different tests and analysis on the fields so that we could come back to you with a very sure understanding of what you had and therefore then how we could help you uh, and recommend to move things forward. So if okay with yourselves, I'll, I'll just pass over to Scott now and let him just run the next um, few slides. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you everybody for having us here tonight and uh, explain all the work that we've done through the feasibility study for Memorial Field. So if we look on the, Ian had just broken down, talked about how we had broken down the park into four different turf grass areas. So now I'm gonna take you through a little bit of the process that we took on each of those fields. Um, the yellow dots here are representing where we did our PQS testing, which is a series of 11 different criteria that we assess athletic fields with. Um, going from group depth, we have a profiler that we can actually see into the soil profile. We also have penetrometers and uh, surface hardness meters, which are able to let us know what the conditions, of, attribute a number to what the compaction in the soil might be and be able to track it around the field to see if it's consistent or if there may be different conditions across the field. Um, we, as you can see, there's many purple dots on here. That's what we use for our composite sampling. Uh, it's very important to understand what your soils have and how they could be best improved in order for us to give you the best information on how to improve the facility. Like Ian also mentioned that we did a, dug a few test pits as well out there, which is goes about down to two feet so we can try to see where your sub your sub uh, sub layers are in the soil. And we hadn't been here, a lot of people, I mean, the Army Corps of Engineers built the soccer field and I'm sure that was, you know, many years ago. I'm not sure there's many people on staff that know what lies underneath there. So it's always great to dig a test pit to actually see the different horizons in, the, in each field um, to, to, again, try to have a better understanding of how the water might move through there if we get extra rain and just to see how much soil depth we have and are able to work with. So here's, so that's the small baseball field area we we're calling football. Um, we were told that's where they like to protect, practice the majority of the time. But as you can see, we still tried to take as many composite samples through the turf areas as much as possible. So even if we were to renovate this area in the process, we would have an idea of what the soils were across the field. Um, same thing in the soccer field. Um, you, you need to get a good wide spread of the composite sample to give you the best idea of what the actual soil uh, composite will be across the field. Um, I will mention as I surveyed all the fields, if there's an area that seems to be a bit shallower or if the material does seem to be a bit sandier or a bit off color, those areas are left out of the composite sample, but I didn't come across any of those through Berwick. Um, the memorial field study. Each field was fairly consistent to each other um, while I was doing the sampling, um, with one exception, which would be right field and the baseball field, which seemed to be a bit of, a little bit firmer than the rest of the uh, the rest of the areas uh, assessed. But we're, we're going to have a good picture of that later, just as a little teaser. So um, here's a here's a just a quick picture of a test pit that we excavated. I believe this one was in the center of the football field. Uh, and as you can see, I mean, we have pretty good, pretty good root development going down through there. Sometimes we'll find layers that are, you know, very compact when people are constructing a field or it might transition to a different horizon, we might call it, which would be a different color, which could become more compact and not allow drainage or rooting to, to go through and develop a good turf grass stand. So it, it's very nice when we're able to see a very uniform profile with even some, you know, sand seams in it. So it's, uh, which is only going to help improve um, infiltration uh, capabilities of the field. We use um, 
Turf and Soil Diagnostics, which is a soil testing laboratory out of New York, and also Logan Laboratories, which is in the Midwest, to do all of our soil testing. So taken from our composite samples, we'll pull a gallon bag together and we'll send it out to the, the labs for further analysis, and they'll come back with physical properties, as well as organic matter content, the pH, everything that we would need in order to give you a good recommendation on what can be done to these fields to improve the turf grass quality. Um, happy to say, well, also to, to add into that, we also tested the infield clays to have those physical properties quantified with the American standards and testing materials. Uh, I believe it's 2107, which is used for baseball field infield construction. So happy to report that those were very close to being in this acceptable specification for baseball infield. So they would not need much of a remediation, at least for the soil structure to have a good baseball infield. Um, maybe some just edging around the edges just to kind of smooth out those transitions going into the grass areas would probably be helpful, but it's good to know that you have a good structure there to start with. And it's really the same can be said for the soils that we found in the field. Um, we do a lot of soil sampling around New England, and it's not, you know, surprising to find 40% silt in some soils and only, you know, 50% or less sand. And every field we tested had over 70% sand, I think the lowest was 72%. So that's a very good, they're classified as, you know, sandy loam still, so there is, doesn't have the greatest infiltration, but you're starting somewhere that can be improved upon there. You don't, we don't feel like you have to start over from square one. Um, I will, so here's a little example of the soil profile um, that we were talking about a bit earlier. As you can see, these are from two different fields. I know they're both number threes and they look like, oh, it's just two of the same, but this is the same numbering process we use for each field. So I believe that these were taking in left field of the two baseball fields. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty uniform. Um, you know, you've got, one's got about seven inches of very consistent material and the second one has eight inches. And it's very, Nice seeing an earthworm in there. So we have some good biological activity and it's relatively free of large stones, which was good to find as well. These are profiles that we took from the infield clay. The one on the right is a little bit deeper. Um, so you can see, we kind of got into those sub-base layers where you can, we can see those horizons that we were talking about. Um, but again, we have six inches of infield material on top. So that's uh, more than enough to be able to work with for, for an infield uh, baseball. I'll touch on performance quality standards, even though it was my friend Ian here who kind of brought it across the pond for, for all of us to utilize yeah. here in the States. Um, but it was, uh, he could speak much more fluently about it, I'm sure than him, uh, but it's a, it's a great tool using a series of specified instruments for turf grass maintenance to help us understand the not only the soil environment, but also the surface environment that might be affecting the agronomy and health of the stand that you maintain. So it's been accepted by the British government. Uh, FIFA has its own series of testing that they that is related to the performance quality testing. So it's a great way for us to follow a standard operating procedure collect a bunch of relevant data, and then be able to compare based on other jobs, that, other history you've had with other jobs, but also what we know has worked in the field to try to help you get to a, a, a more uh, acceptable place of where you'd like to be. So it's uh, when we do the full test, I mean, it's over 300 tests across the field, um, up to you know 30 criteria. Um, for our focus, we were on you know, soil compaction, surface hardness, which are directly relate to the safety of an athletic field. But then it also, can also, it also has a big effect on the health of the grass that you might have and being able to have an aesthetically pleasing field. The last function of the performance quality standards focuses on structure, which I was able to ascertain and try to let you guys know everything looks pretty good structurally wise. Um, for the soils of the field, and they're, they're very workable. I think we're seeing that this year with some of the initial results from the maintenance policy we put together. So based on all the data that we collect, we're then able to uh, create images such as the one you're seeing up here. This is just an example that we've done from other fields. Uh, 
um, judging surface hardness of a field. So as you can see, the redder areas were where you get higher readings. So as we assess fields, you know, year after year, we're able to show field managers whether you're becoming more red or maybe your field is becoming more blue and more uniform so that way we can get consistent playing conditions across the field and help the managers pinpoint why that's happening. Um, one other note, Ian had touched on the drainage evaluation function. That was one area where we did find that there was some planarity issues in some of the fields, which is to be expected um, with a, a park that has been around for you know decades and maybe hasn't gotten the maintenance regimes that we would, yeah. we would recommend. So areas that are a little shallower, as we get more rain and it collects, those areas tend to settle more and, and, and increase in size. So that creates an entirely different growing environment and likely why you see certain areas that have better grass than others. So in time, those will be addressed through maintenance practices or through renovation opportunities. But for the most part, even walking out there today, the field, fields are holding up very good. There's, you know, high traffic areas in the goal mouse are, are, you know, get worn and that's can be said for really any field, but some of the wing areas, I mean, just from the last time I was here for the irrigation study, it's, it's great to see everything coming around with a, some fertilizer and seed put out on, on the fields. And it's great to see people there enjoying it too. So we'll pass it back over to you for the usage. Great, thanks Scott. Um, yeah, so as Scott was saying, um, you know, part of our study when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we were looking at things is, so we're taking all of that information that Scott has um, garnered and collected and, um, and worked so hard for digging two feet deep holes in, in, the, in the soil with a hand tool is, um, it's okay doing one, but when you've, done, when you've done sort of eight or nine, like you did, you know, Memorial Field, it, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we, we do the, as much as we can with that information. And then what we have is, when we have the, the information from Scott's um, investigations and analysis and, and evaluation, then we then look at, well, what's causing what we're seeing? And in most cases, if not all cases, it's down to the usage. Um, yes, the maintenance plays a, a, a crucial part to that also, um, either lack of it or plenty of it. It doesn't really make a lot of difference, but we really look at the usage. And when we look at usage, we're not looking just at how many people might play on a field, for instance. We're looking at the areas in which they play as well. So Scott had alluded to it with the previous slide, which showed that what we call a heat map. Um, and, and I might just sort of just go back to that. So that heat map is showing us where the most usage is taking place. So the dark blue or light blue areas, it's not really taking place there. But you start to look the yellow, the red, um, that's where a lot of usage is. Well, when we spoke to the particular manager about this, he was able to say, oh yeah, that's the area that they walk straight out of the changing rooms. Um, so that right-hand side is you're looking at the slide and that's where they all play. And we were saying, well, that's where we're seeing the worst conditions. So we were able then to direct him to remove that as an option and make all of the usage more directed across the field. So it was a great help to him because he could not solve and he would have games called off because that area would stay wet all the time because it was just being overcompacted and overused. So when we look at our usage calculator, um, we're also looking at where that usage is taking place. And then we put the two together and then we're able to say, well, this is what Scott found. This is what he's, he's seen. This is what the laboratories are telling us when they've analyzed our soils. Um, and this is what we're actually seeing when we when we plug usage in. So one of the things I did with Angela is I asked Angela to give me the best information she could from all of the sports groups of how they use the field, how often. And all sports groups are very forthcoming with that, so I can't thank them enough because it only helps improve the calculation, um, you, you know, to that to that end. And then we took all of that information and we fed it into our calculator. Now, a calculator is probably a little bit different to any that you may know of out in the industry. It doesn't just work on um, one person for one hour. 
we're working on the height, the average height, the average weight, the average shoe size of every age group. Uh, now, okay, there, there are averages there, so we're not perfect, but we're a lot closer to that. And the way that it then calculates is it will calculate something, the field, before we actually do anything to it. So we don't maintain it. We don't, um, we don't even build it correctly, let's say, because it's already built. And then it gives us what we call a design capacity. So that's telling us what that field is capable of before we put usage on and before we start maintaining it. And then we put all of the play or the use on there and then we add in the maintenance. And what we end up with, as you can see, as an example, I'm sorry, that's not, that's gonna be a little bit tough for you guys to see it, you know, in here, but we end up with, um, you know, two different um, speedos as we call them, uh, speedometers. Uh, that's what we build it on. And those speedometers are actually telling us whether or not the field is in a good condition or it's in a challenged condition. And from there, we're able then to say, right, at the moment, Berwick as a town is putting X amount of maintenance into the fields. And that is then calculated in, and then that gives <coughs> us a rating. And then what we do then is we say, and that rating might not be good at that point. And that's no disrespect to the town. It's no disrespect to the people maintaining the fields. It's just where we are. We then say, well, let's see if we maintain things a little bit more and we put more frequency to the maintenance and we do better types of maintenance, would that improve the fields? And then we run that back through the calculator. What that enables us to do is to show you that look, if we're able to, if you're able to do a little bit more maintenance um, and even pinpoint the type of maintenance, whether it be aerification, overseeding, um, top dressing, better nutrition, um, good irrigation, um, you know, how that field can improve. And that's what we're looking for because we have the existing conditions analysis from Scott and his investigation. So we know what you have. What we want to understand is how did it get there and how can we help you, if it's not in a good place, move from there? And that's how that the calculator, that's why I wanted to spend just a little bit of time, you know, talking that through with you, because this has been absolutely essential to most of our work when we're working with facilities, when we're working with towns and municipals, because I hazard a guess that most of you would know that the fields are well used but to how well they're used or how overused they may be, you might not realize. And sometimes nobody would realize that. Uh, when I was a grounds manager, even I didn't realize how, how, how often my fields were actually being used until I sat down and thought about it. So this is where the uses calculator is a huge help for us. And it helps us then create what we call a usage analysis. So we're taking all of the calculations then and all of the implications of either not enough maintenance or too much or, or, or enough maintenance, and we're able to come up with a, with a viable solution. Now that might be something that we need to say to you, here's what it is. We're not suggesting that you're gonna be able to change overnight, but we might say, let's try and do that or, or help you do that over two or three years period. And that's how we generally work with a lot of our clients. So again, I know you can't see these, these graphics too well sitting in the room, um, but they are in the report. Um, so you'll see them in the report. So for those on Zoom, the left-hand graphic is that was what we found from the existing conditions and the usage of the field. So you can see that both of the speedos, uh, we just changed the concept of the speedos, both of the speedos are in what we call damaging. So what that's telling us straight away is that the fields are being overused and under-maintained. Um, and again, no disrespect intended from that. Um, but it's great to understand that because at least we know where we are and we can't manage what we don't measure as we say. So we know that. Now we ran the right-hand slide. We ran a scenario of if we improve the maintenance, frequency, type, then look where all of the needles are then. Um, we're in the, um, you know, we're in the yellow zone, which is still a warning to us, 
but it's not the red zone type thing. So we're not overexerting the fields and then not being able to maintain them and, and keep them in good, good condition. So we took that analysis to then help build a maintenance program that would work for the fields. And as Scott said, um, you, you know, I'm not saying that we're out of the woods with this at all, but I think we've seen some nice improvements with the fields. Um, some have been weather assisted for sure, um, because we haven't been through our dry summers like we normally have. But you know what? That's created just as equal a challenge for us because we've had so much water fall that we can't drain it very well at the minute. And we're having fields that we're really struggling with drainage at the minute because they're not, they wouldn't normally have that issue in the middle of July and August. So, but that's just the value of, of taking all of that information just for one aspect of what we did and being able to then calculate that and then create a solid plan that's not built on my opinion or Scott's opinion, it's built on the facts. And that's the really important part of this um, as we move forward. Moving on then to the study, and I'm trying to keep the time you know, reasonably tight. Um, we do what we call the concepts, visions, and values interviews. And uh, I'm, I know I'm already over time, aren't I? I'm sure I am. Sorry. Um, I, 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 I warned everybody ahead of time that you were, you were very vocal about graph <laughs> in <laughs> turf. <laughs> oh, I've got the five minute warning from James. Yeah. Uh, well, I've only got 25 slides, guys, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> I was sent, I was joking with the guys earlier that they used to call me Machine Gun Mike because I'd do a presentation, I'd get halfway through and be woefully over time, and then I'd just start banging the button like that and, you know, <laughs> just created that, that thing. I won't go through all of these, but this was a really, really crucial part of our study for you, um, you, you know, when we carried it out. I mean, we learned so much from this. I'll be honest with you, this is just one third of the outcomes that we got from the feasibility interviews. Um, it's all in the reports, um, but um, but yeah, this was these, these were just some of the big things that I picked up on from the from the interviews, and and as I say, not everything is negative. Um, we did, as those people that were interviewed by me, I did allow five minutes of negativity, if you so wished, to you know uh, what's the word, empty your bucket type thing, and and then it was right. Let's now now let's look at how you know, things can be improved, you know. Um, so we asked a very pointed series of questions to help that process. And we didn't let you have them beforehand. This is all of those who are interviewed would know. Um, it was my secret type thing until I met you. And that was because we wanted your natural reaction from a question that, that I was asking. And we got, as I say, some phenomenal answers, phenomenal ideas, and most of what you'll see in the reports and in the back end of this presentation came from those interviews. Yes, we still took a lot of interest from the usage um, and the you know, existing conditions and so on, but a lot of that came from these interviews. So again, a, a heartfelt thank you to everybody that, that participated. And I'm sorry if I didn't manage to interview everybody, but you know, normally we do six or eight, and I did, I think, 18 interviews in the end. And it was just wonderful to do that. So, you know, thank you for that element. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sure I'm on the three minute one and now from James. Um, my five minutes last a lot longer in England. I'm five hours ahead. So, you know, I've still right. got four and a half hours to go. So sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, what were our general findings? And again, this is not everything we found, but these are just the key areas. So. So we know that the surface performance, as we call that for your fields, is a challenge. Um, it's not awful, it's not terrible, but it's a challenge. And, and Scott alluded to that very well with just what we call the planarity issues, the undulations that are out there on the fields. Um, you know, um, the fields all scored in the C to C minus range, which actually is not bad. And I think that backs up what we've been saying, that this might be room for improvement, and we think that there is, and we think we can help you improve. Um, but ultimately, to have those fields in those conditions is, um, is actually not a bad thing at all. Um, as you can see there, the turf cover, the planarity, again, just little, you know, alluding to what Scott was talking about. 
Um, infiltration rates were low, and that's a challenge for us because even though those soils look really good, that because they're very organic in nature, that by its very nature holds moisture much better. So we wanna make sure that we can give you free draining fields. And we've actually seen that we've been on the fields today with Angela, um, you know, and um, we, we were able to see that firsthand that when the rains come, the compaction starts, then the fields don't drain very well. So that's part of our strategy to you to help you improve that. Um, and then hopefully we'll have, you know, better, um, you, you know, um, draining fields. Um, the fields are overused. That was fairly obvious. And what I mean by that is that it, some fields were actually underused, but some were completely overused. So what we want to try and do now with our usage analysis is try and balance that usage uh, and rotate that usage a little bit better. I noticed today that the football teams were up at the field and they were very, they were working with us. They were trying to stay off the worn areas and go to the nice grassed areas. We call that field rotation. That's great. And we appreciate that from them. So, you know, um, there is no dedicated grounds person that looks after Memorial Field. And I think that's something that we would hope that you can try and address in the future. It doesn't necessarily need to be somebody on a full-time basis, but certainly somebody that can, you know, um, maybe do 20 to 25 hours a week at that facility, um, or maybe spread their, their overall full-time employment between two or three um, areas, that would be really helpful. And I think that will then build on everything that, that we've seen and we're trying to, to help, you know, happen. I'm just throwing these out there. I know that these all come with a cost and they're all a budgetary requirement, but... Um, but again, you know, first let's let's tell you what we think. Then then we can you, you know work with you to decide how best um, you know to improve them. Um, equipment for grounds maintenance is required. Well, ironically, as we'll come to a little bit later, uh, very quickly in James's case, um, we've now helped the town appreciate that a little bit. And actually, without blowing. Angela's trumpet for her, but she actually was trained today on how to use one of a ride on mower. And she was an absolute star. And we've got videos which will go on social media and to everybody that needs to, to see that. So now she was fantastic. So, um, you know, a great opportunity in that sense. And then lastly, the, 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 the project's concept study findings is, um, and again, I don't want anybody, please don't take any of these disrespectfully. They're not meant that way. Um, we try and be as fair as we can when, you, when we write these findings. Um, we know that, that the continuation, you know, there's new team members coming in all the time. So that takes time for them to settle in. We know that Steve, you know, has now pretty much retired and James has taken over. So it's a transition for James you know, and everybody connected to the town. So we appreciate that some of those things are going to take time to settle down. Angela's come in, you know, uh, I call her the Tasmanian devil because, you know, she's just nonstop. Uh, she's a whirlwind with everything, has a phenomenal passion. Um, you know, so again, it's it's a settling in period for everybody at the minute. So we, we will try and, and help you where we can with that. Um, but But generally, there's a desire for really good facilities. Um, you know, not, not just at Memorial Field, but across, across the town. So, you know, I think we're all together on that one. Um, and then there's a couple of, you know, smaller ones, such as, you know, the bathrooms um, up at the fields. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, I was able to use the port of loos today, as I call them. And, um, you know, very nice that they were. But they're not the same as, as, as obviously going into a building and, and using the building um, facilities. Um, so, um, so yeah, just some things that we want to think about um, from that. The parking lots, when we say need to be improved, we do specify that in the report. So don't don't feel as though we're just saying, hey, they need to be improved. We said straight away that for one of the things that that Angela and I noticed and and James noticed um, the the newer car park, which was sorry, parking lot car park. I'll call it a car park. Um, I said it would be good not just to have the stones that denoted a parking space, but also have it marked out. Because I noticed even today when we were pulling out of the car park and all of the football guys were turning up, 
is that cars were not parking what I would call square. And, and that's not their fault, but that's what we noticed. So it's sort of, we looked at each other and thought, yeah, you know, we need, we need to, at some point, I think, you know, mark them out as best as possible. So, so that was just one thing we noticed. Recommendations, there's a lot of recommendations. Again, please don't say that disrespectfully that um, we did a lot of analysis. We did a lot of evaluations. Um, you know, we went, um, you know, we went through everything as carefully as we could. And it's come out with what we call the short term actions. So they're things that we feel the town may be able to achieve, you know, by the back end of this year, or certainly the back end of next year. And that might still be a little bit aggressive. But we wanted to at least um, you know, in a nice way, challenge the town to those things. Um, and as you can see from some of them, some of them might be very easily the low hanging fruit, as we say, some of them might need a little bit more attention and time and, and most likely budget discussions. So I appreciate that. And, you know, it's funny when Tom was sort of talking about the fire and the police, and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, and I'm going to follow up saying I've got like 91 recommendations for you here. Um, so, you know, um, um, I was thinking maybe I shouldn't even show this slide. But no, I, 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 joking aside, you know, the recommendations are there. They don't have to be done in those years. We know that. But we like to start with, well, let's see if we could. And then if we can't, then let's reassess. And I think that's that's always fair on both sides. Um, then we get to the longer term planning. So these are the things that we probably would see as the more expensive items, if you like. Um, you know, not necessarily, but 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 more often than not, they are. And then that future planning uh, and vision, and that's the thing where we really sort of you know can dream a little bit and take all of the short and the long term and box them up with the vision, and then say, right here we go. And obviously, we're going to come to that in a minute. We did some budgetary considerations. Um, we looked at some of those recommendations um, for the town. And, you know, these prices aren't hot off the press. They aren't exact. But we went and we got within a range of what we felt, you know, was, was, was responsible um, for, you know, for the town. So some things, I'm sure everybody could look at this and say, oh, well, I can get that cheaper or we could do that less expensive. Great, if that's the case. Um, we tried not to overestimate too much either, because that's just really, um, that's just going to sink your boat type thing. You know, we want to try and make it as realistic and as close as we can. Um, but again, I'm sure that, you know, with all of the resources that the town and its people have, I'm sure there's going to be op opportunities to save money on some of this list if it came to that. And, you know, there would nobody, nobody more than myself and Scott would welcome the local support to improve some of the things in the facility for sure. Um, I think that's a thing that's actually sadly been missing over the years. And it's, it's great that I know I've talked to a lot of people through the interviews who feel very strongly about that, um, you know, and, and certainly we're on board with that as well. So, um, so really, we come to the concepts, and the, the concepts are up on the easel. That's the name of it, an easel. <laughs> I got it, see? Uh, it might be a bit slow, but I got there. Um, but um, we talked about some of the, um, the, the, the plan boards there, as you can see, uh, for those in the room and for those on Zoom, you should be able to see these reasonably well. Um, so we broke it down into sort of three phases as we saw it. Phase one might consist of what the plan is looking like at the minute on the screen. Um, that we certainly have done a lot of preparations with play area experts. Um, you know, one of the big findings from the feasibility was the, the play areas as they currently exist, uh, are not only in a very dangerous position in some cases, uh, very close to, you know, um, baseball uh, and you know yes maybe nobody ever hits the ball that far but somebody could um, and then also the the general condition of those play areas we felt was it was they were old they were tired in some respects they were unsafe 
And, um, you know, we, we appreciate how that can happen, but also, you know, that was one of the things that we felt would be, you know, on that list early on to try and, to try and improve, um, but also relocating things at the same time. And as you can see um, from, from the, the basketball um, area, we have relocated it. We've turned it, you know, 45 degrees or so, 90 degrees. Uh, it looks like 45 actually. Um, and that then provides space potentially to put the play area, um, you know, so we're suddenly creating space and sadly we will most likely lose two or three beautiful trees, but we may be able to, to even um, protect those and, and, um, and it may be worth, you know, transplanting those trees rather than um, just, just, you know, cutting them down. So that's sort of, you know, um, one area. We also looked at, as you can see, the batting cages have moved from really where the playscape area is now or where we're proposing it should be. The batting cages have been moved more towards the edge of the field, which is actually safer from a field perspective um, and uh, actually gives the batting cages a new lease of life because they can be rebuilt. Um, we had some great comments from the baseball guys on that, that, well, what about a synthetic um, uh, field, uh, not, a, not a field, a batting cage as well as the as a natural turf and that's a great idea. So when it gets too wet or the, the natural turf gets warm, then it can go on the synthetic version. So, you know, a great idea is on, on that side of things that we, we garnered over time. Then we start to think about what potentially, um, you know, phase two might look like. One of the big things that we found in our study from the interviews, from just generally talking to people, is there seemed to be nothing but sport that you could really do at this facility. And yet a lot of people were saying, well, I'd love to just spend some time sitting on a bench and just listening, watching the world go by type thing. So we came up with what we are, are calling uh, that top right-hand corner, like a pocket park. That's an area of the fields that isn't actually used anymore. And I was surprised at that when I talked to James, because football used to use that according to James, but then it seemed to have moved down in towards the middle of that facility. So, so we suddenly thought, well, if nobody's using that area, then why don't we turn it into something uh, that's a little bit more um, you know, useful? And uh, that's where we thought of the pocket park. And, and we don't have the exact design at this moment for sure but we felt that was a nice area it would be relatively easy to maintain for the town we would obviously design it so it could be maintained relatively easy um, but it would just give people a little bit of a haven away from sport even though you sat and I sort of had it in my head that it reminded me a little bit of like Central Park that inside the metropolis of New York is suddenly this beautiful green space. And I know when I visited New York, you literally walk through those park gates and you, the traffic stops, you don't hear it. Um, it's amazing. And so we thought, well, why can't we have our own little central park on this facility where you can just visit, sit, relax, bring your grandchildren, bring your children, mothers, fathers, um, you know, or just anybody, you know, that just wants to come for a walk, relax, read a book for half an hour. Um, so that was where the idea came from of utilizing a piece of space that we could certainly utilize more for sport if we wanted to, but we didn't need to actually. So why, why do that? Why not make it into something that could be well used by you know, the, the community? And also thinking about what really drove us to this point was that potential development that James, you know, first told us about bringing all those new families potentially into the town, right into the town center. And then we being able to give them something like a small mini park, a micro park, if you want to call it that, that's, that's right on their doorstep. And this is, we just looked at providing a different entrance. And again, these are any concept uh, drawings, um, but just, just so you can start to see 
Um, there could be little work little workout stations around there. And you can see that the starting of, of a walkway. So the yellow that you see there is actually a walkway. And, and obviously that would be ADA compliant, um, but just something that then created a little bit more structure to the facility without um, you know, overpowering it with concrete type thing or asphalt. Um, but just, you know, just just sort of looking at that area and, and trying to improve an area that at the minute that really doesn't do anything and it's not saying anything to us. Um, so having it having it say something. And then we looked at the last concept, and I'm very nearly finished, James. So my five minutes is nearly up, I know, thank you. Um, but uh, we looked at the last concept really, which was phase three. And that was where we thought, let's, let's just, let's dream now, let's go for this. Let's put everything that we've got on the table uh, as an option. Now, some things have already been, if you like, improved in phase one and phase two. So it's not a total start again. Uh, hopefully, if the phases have been able to be followed over the years, um, then we get to what you're seeing now as, as potentially phase three. Um, and, and again, I'll say this um, respectfully, none of this has been agreed by anybody, um, you know, apart from us putting this as a concept to you. So we're not, we're not suggesting that, you know, you're going to run out and, and write a blank check for all of this at all. Oh, but, no, the, the, the hate book page tomorrow will be talking about the millions of dollars we need for Central Park. Oh, sorry, sorry. That will be what we have coming out. But no well, problem. Well, at least we're calling it something good, aren't we, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> and, and really, you know, fortuitously for the, for the town to purchase the, the extra land, is we then may have an option to create a little bit more space in the future if it's needed. You take that in consideration that we did buy that? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's in consideration? Yep, yeah. that's in there, Mark, yeah. Um, we even tested it. Yeah, that's right, yeah, we even went out there and Tef, poor Scott, you know, did a did a sort of a- Poor, poor you know, Scott, we went for a nature hike this spring. Did a, an, an extreme <laughs> nature trail testing for, process for us. So yeah, you know, he came back with all kinds of bites and bumps. And everything, but uh, but he did it. So you know we can't thank him enough. But yeah, that was one of the reasons that we did it because we wanted to see would it be viable to potentially use for um, facilities. Now it doesn't mean to say you have to use it for two extra soccer fields or, or being able to turn the soccer fields around. You could decide as a town that you want to use it for nature trails, for you know mountain biking, whatever you think is is useful for that. Um, but we just put it there as, well, this is one concept and it's not the only one. Um, but we thought that um, having that little bit of extra space might be useful in the future when the, 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 the development and the, the housing is built and that there might be more demand on this, on this facility um, at that point. Um, so, and the big things really that we're looking at in phase three is things like you know, the playscape area is already in, so we're already assuming that's been going, a, you know, a couple of years type thing. But the splash pad, we felt um, wherever I've been where there's a splash pad, it is just like bees to honey, um, especially with, you know, people, families, you know, there is nothing better than watching a three or four year old. My son, I could never get him out of them when he was that age. So, you know, so we felt that that would be a really nice place to have it. We felt that extending the shelter from where it is at the minute further out didn't, Im didn't impact any sports, but gave a lot more opportunity for people to sit in the shelter in the heat of the, the sun, watch their children literally five yards away, being, you, you know, everything became what we call the hub. So that from a parent's perspective, um, whether, whether it's sport that the children are playing or whether it's just enjoyment, whether it's just recreation, um, that they would always have eyes on them and not be split from where they were trying to look. Um, they could all do that from that central area. So, so that's sort of where we got to with our, with our planning. Um, and again, concept only at the minute, but you know, we wanted to at least um, you know, give you some idea of how we came to this. And this isn't just us, and we're not designers. We'll be the first to say that we're not architects, we're not designers in that sense. Um, I wouldn't know how to design half of this stuff 
But what we did do is we took all of the information that came from this study to be able to create this. So we do know that it's worthy of everybody's efforts and thoughts and, and ideas and, and, and comments that went into this. It's not just us sitting there, you know, in, in a dark room and saying, well, I think we should do this today. You know, there's a lot of thought from our perspective gone in that came from, from you and that's fueled us in the right direction. So, so you know, that side of it, very, very proud of, of our team, how we've done that. Um, and then this is just a little bit of a close up as we finish, pretty much finish off. Um, you know, so you can see, we tried to leave, show you where things would be relocated to, um, so that you'd see how that area, um, you know, could be utilized for, for, for other things. Um, the thing about having a splash pad there, just the last thing I want to say, not only is it close to the hub and, you know, the parents and, and that potential, but it's also close to all of the um, irrigation pipe work. So we can feed straight off that um, and add something very simply to that, um, that, that then allows the splash pad to function without having to put in expensive piping, um, you know. Um, so that, that obviously was an advantage of keeping it close to that and not having to run you know, expensive pipe work. That, that isn't a two-wire system out there, is it? The irrigation? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Um, you I'm mentioned sure. a controller. What's wrong with a controller? The brand new controller. We, we, we just upgraded the controller. Okay. Um, and I'll come to that right now because here we go. So, um, so yeah, so there were um, some issues with the irrigation system. Um, so what we, what we looked at was, well, how do we make it efficient? And really there was no other way than to upgrade and improve um, a lot of the facility, a lot of that system. So that's what we set about doing. And, um, and what we have now is we have an irrigation system that is currently being um, monitored by an irrigation contractor that, that did the work from the smartphone. So Angela will have access to it from a smartphone. Anybody in the town that, that, that needs to have access to it can then operate the irrigation system, close it down, open it up. Uh, well, not the winterization and spring opening, but certainly um, using it and turning it off from a smartphone now. So that was part of the controller upgrade that we suggested. And the reason why we suggested that was because we had so many people breaking into it and um, and deciding to water it whenever they felt like it needed it. Um, yeah. And so, hey, Angela, could yeah. you speak into the microphone? Does this work? Yeah, it should. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it should work. <laughs> so the reason why we did the um, the wireless system was because we had so many people breaking into it and just watering the field when they felt like it. Um, our water. Our expense to our water was almost seven thousand dollars when I looked at it, and it should have been like around fifteen hundred. Um, but it was because of the broken heads that were there. Um, we had different heads that were out there that it should have been uniformed, and now it is. Um, and now the Wi-Fi system that I will have access to um, once I set it up, um, I'll be able to turn it on and turn it off from wherever I am, and then I can also go into the software system and also finagle it if I need to. Yeah, so obviously that was a big part of um, helping the health of the athletic fields as we move forward. Um, part, of the, um, part of the approach is to improve the maintenance at the same time. So because we're gonna be doing more frequent maintenance, we needed an efficient and an effective irrigation system to support that. Um, and I think we all know that this year was pretty much an anomaly when it comes to water, you know, having an excess of water. But at least we know now in the future that the irrigation is going to be efficient and effective from a town perspective as well, because water is a, a, a hot commodity, as we know. And we don't want to waste it. And we want to protect the environment, protect, obviously, water sources as much as possible. So, so that was obviously, you know, something that we felt was really important. <clears throat> <laughs> and, and, and actually, if that couldn't have been done, then it would have changed our advice because we would have said, OK, 
If we're not able to do that, then we're going to have to change how we maintain the fields. Um, so, so obviously that was there's was something that we 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 definitely put in to um, to to improve. A couple of other things just to, to pick up on there, things that are being planned. They haven't actually gone ahead yet, but they're being planned. And what that means is that we've not committed to anything. Um, we've just committed to the actual planning of it at the moment um, so that we get to a point where it would most likely have to come for a budgetary decision anyway. Um, so, But we want to at least do that forework for, for that point at which we can come back and then say, right, yes, we've done our diligence, we've done the homework, and you know, this is this is what we'd like to present to you as a possible expenditure in the future. Um, I mean, installing things like floodlights to a portion of the soccer field, as you can see from the photograph there, that would be the opposite end to the end you're looking at now. On the photograph um, but again that will give us a little bit more flexibility of use um, it will also create a little bit more of a challenge because within with, with any facilities where you have lights there's generally is more usage for longer periods so but again we've taken that into account with the maintenance program at this moment and we'll be ready to you know to keep that going um, if need be um, some of the equipment that I you know, you know, suggest was saying earlier on that Andrew had, had um, been using today, um, you know, was very beneficial as a purchase from, from for the Tau's perspective because it gives Angela, now she had basically can mow those fields pretty much on her own if needed um, or train somebody up through with our help. Um, to use it, then it's not as reliant on the public works department to come and help, um, because I know that they're being stretched as well. Um, <clears throat> when I interviewed Jody, you know, he was telling me that. So all of these things are, are to try and balance and make the opportunity to improve the fields more consistent for for Angela and for you know for for the town. Um, so there's a lot already gone on and there's a lot more to go on um yep some of it will will certainly as i say have to come before the town for um you know for further anal analysis and and obviously you know at some point budgetary decisions but um hopefully you can see that you know in in a short period of time relatively there's there's quite a few things that have changed uh for the better there already we're already working on like yeah has like Ian had said, we're already working on, you know, I've already purchased the equipment so I can utilize the equipment for the field so I can do the my own work out there. Um, to like, like Ian said, to take the pressure off of Jody over at public and Robert over at public works. Um, we've been working with, you know, I've been working with Drew on the field policies and to establish um, the standards for the work that needs to be done out there as well. Um, we're going to try to centralize, like Ian says in this, centralize the tracking of users and fees that we'll eventually install um, and have people, you know, pay the user fees to get up onto the field because we're going to need those to maintain the fields. Aren't we charging user fees now? No. Nothing? Nothing. I thought the baseball boys did. No. Though. Nothing. They we're not, we're not charging right anything. Yeah. No, there's never been a set policy for any user fees. Well, I thought we generate no money other than what the town provides. Yeah, exactly. They so pay for certain projects. Yeah, I think that have happened down there. You know, pay for a little baseball Gym dugouts oh, so, and things like that. So they do do that, right? Yeah. They do do work. We purchased but, the uh, the um, materials, the materials, yeah. and they volunteered to do the stuff. Labor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but besides that. It's um, and that's not a consistent revenue stream. That's just right as things come up and need to happen. So we need to establish a user fee um, to dump back into our maintenance plan eventually down the line. Um, it's not it's not to be mean to anybody or to say we need your money or anything like that. It's really to maintain and sustain what we have, and um, and it's not all Berwick users. Um, there are kids from the whole district that use it, and um, but everybody's using our fields, and so we have to maintain these fields if 
people from North Warwick are going to be using it and Lebanon are going to be using it because they're all in MS 8060, which is noble. Um, so that's something that we need to look forward to the future. Mm. One, of the, one of the things I've talked about for years is over at the Hussey School, we have a field that never gets used. And I don't know why that can't you know, be taken into consideration when you're doing something like this. Mm. Why? Why is that being used? Why isn't the town using it? Well, right? I, I don't think it's any problem. <clears throat> It, it, rotate it, the fields if you got to rotate for a yeah, season. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, you know, if there's extra field space that's available, then by all means. But it's not. Know. It's not town field. Right. It's the yeah. school yeah. district field, and that's where we. we is there are groups associated with the school district? They are not officially part of the school. Well, you know what? Tony? But well, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's just like tough. Yeah. They're going to have to figure out how to let's use them. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, now, any of the towns that you've been to, my, I'm sorry. Microphone, if you. Any other towns that you've been to, has there been it? You, have you learned anything where there's unique ways of raising money? To, well, this well first, first, first of all, the biggest shock to me was that you don't charge user fees right. for that facility. I mean, that is almost unheard of in every town and yeah. city we've worked in. It really doesn't happen that often. Um, in fact, I, I struggled to think of when I last heard that comment. So that obviously is a lifeblood of a facility. Um, now, again, Angel, as Angel was saying, the user fees vary from town to, to state. But one thing is for sure, they're not outrageous fees. Um, they're really not. And most towns will say, look, we don't want you to pay for all of the maintenance of these fields, but you have to contribute to them so that we can take the pressure off the central budget or the you know, recreation budgets you know, fading down from that. So for me, it's very unusual. And of course, when we hear of that, we immediately think, well, how can we help you as a town? Well, the first thing that we've got to help you and be tough with you and say is you have to charge user fees. Now you don't have to, as I say, you know, you, we could tell you what it costs to maintain every square foot of that field, of those fields. Quite categorically, we could prove it to anybody that would want that information, that this is what it's gonna cost for every square foot. You could then take that and decide as a town how you want to you know, use that from a user fee perspective of setting them. And you might say, well, we're happy to fund 50% of that, that fee, fine then the users then fund the other 50%. Now it's great, as Drew said, that the, the are, there are projects that, that the sports groups do you know, contribute to, and that, that's great, but they're one-off <laughs> projects um, that then leave you as a town with no further income. Um, and actually some of those projects are actually gonna cost you as a town more money because then you've gotta maintain them better. Um, so it becomes like a vicious circle almost if you're not careful. So for me, it would definitely, the first thing I would say, Mark, and to the committee and to the, to the board, sorry, is that that would be a pretty urgent thing to discuss, um, you know? And I think that where it fits in with the progress, as Angela was saying, is that you now have field policies that are, are gonna actually help people use the fields more efficiently and effectively, for one, how they, how they um, schedule them, the timing, um, you know, that's going to that's gonna feed directly. Where our maintenance program feeds directly into that now, or will do, sorry, when it's uploaded, so that all of that then can be done holistically, so that there's none of this, well, we can't go on on a Tuesday because the air raid in the field or whatever. So those will be blanked out days because we need them for the maintenance. And that way, everybody can plan better and plan in January rather than, you know, the end of April when the season's upon us, um, you know, I know, sorry, but, uh, but no, to, to answer the question, I mean, certainly you can look at other funding mechanisms that might help, but I would say without being unfair to any of the sports groups, it's start with the sports groups. Well, what are the other ways of raising money besides the sports groups? Can we sell like uh, advertising on the fence? Like, the gas station or the Aroma Joe's or Dunkin' Donuts, that's another way of doing it? 
Yeah, I mean, potentially, it depends what your town charter is to allowing that type of thing to take place. But I don't know your commercial, you know, yeah. um, uh, situation. But certainly, I would be looking at that. You know, a commercial manager for a for a larger town maybe would be looking at that and saying that is prime real estate. You know, we're gonna we're gonna plaster as many businesses and you know facilities uh, organizations on that on those walls as we can um to you know to to help if you like fund um projects for sure what about um, what about working with the school like the high school yeah they have to do so many community service hours in order to graduate right how about utilizing some of those students in order to help with plant mate, like lawn mowing is what yeah. i'm thinking or we've, things like that we've actually been talking with um there's a brand new person that came on board um, she's a transitional coach or a transitional specialist, specialist mm. at the high school. And we've actually, I've showed her the plans and all of that stuff. And we're going to start talking about possibly bringing those, some of those older kids in to learn how to use the mower to really work with public work. So we're already trying to navigate that path right now, um, which would be really good for those kids. Yeah, and well, good for the kids and also good for us as far as manpower goes. And yeah. we're really working with um, kind of the kids that are um, more not really into the sports aspect of it, but more our hands-on workers. So we can really, you know, maybe spark an interest in them. So they'll Some stay sort of with location. us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that are living here and want to stay here and, you know, kind of help them throughout that whole thing. Well, even to take that a step further too, like some of those one-off small projects, I mean, that's, that's not a bad Eagle Scout project too, for, for anybody, you know, and, and build a team and, and get that volunteer time around too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and those are the partnerships that you can look at. I mean, Coastal Riptide, I know that we met mm -hmm. with them and, and I interviewed uh, Jana yeah. uh, from there and, you know, they do a lot of good work um, and help facilities improve. Um, now, yes, th their partnership is they want they want airtime, they want they want playtime. Yep. But you know that that might be something that's worth considering. But I would say that start with the user groups first, see what kind of investment they can give you, to then see if there's a shortfall and if then you do have to go further afield. And all the, and all the while, as you say, Linda, those <coughs> partnerships, those you know vo vocational opportunities are fantastic um to help yeah. you know even even our local community groups we have an american legion that yep. might pick up you've got these this budgetary consideration list of all these things you'd like to see added which i, I think are great but say the american legion picked up you know the splash pad or another group picked up yep. this thing yeah. absolutely and, and, and they all they want is you know it's called the american legion splash pad call yep. it yeah. exactly that's how a lot of they pay rotary for. clubs there's a rotary club sponsor, rotary. parks and yep. splash yep. pads right. and stuff like that. I know uh, Sanford Springville Rotary um, tends to do a lot of things with uh, trails and parks. Yep. They love to get involved in a lot of that. I, I do want to move this along. Yep. We've sorry. been on more than an hour on this, and we have other business we have to take care sorry. of. Sorry, I appreciate yep. it. I'm sorry about that, Tommy. I appreciate the time. Well, just to give you a, just a, um, it doesn't look a very inviting photograph to finish off, but um, but that is actually, you know, as we call the germination. So that was an area that was pretty beat up through overuse and, and obviously weather. And so, you, you know, uh, the specialists that are working on the fields from time to time, uh, they came in and they overseeded that area with what we call a disc seeder. And there you see, you know, the new germination of the new turf. So, you know, the recovery is there. So, you know, but, uh, and... You know, just to finish off with whatever happens, you know, like to may the force be with you type thing. So, <laughs> you know, sorry, it's just a bit of a daft joke. <laughs> and thank you so much for the time that you've allowed us to have. We really appreciate it. You know, we've uh, we spent a lot of time in and out of Berwick over the last eight months. I love I love coming up here as Scott does. And, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity to, first of all, work with you. And now, you know, um, start this process of, um, you know, moving forward, hopefully. Well, there's a lot of here to digest. Is, uh, yeah. So yeah. Is, I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions for you coming up. Yep. And um, the, you know, the, the plan will be available to the public. So yep. is, uh, we invite the public to take a look at it and uh, 
chip in, chip, you know, tell us what they think. So. Please do, yeah. We, we would appreciate the feedback, I promise you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you a couple minutes to pick up your stuff here. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Tell the name you want. Yeah. It doesn't have to be thousands. It can be something. Yeah. Well, it is one thing that you know is Ian you know made to slip a couple of times and talked about Memorial Park instead of Memorial Field, and that's one of the things they talked about. Is, just changing the name from the park from field is, uh, from what I can understand, is the it was named Memorial Field, you know, after World War II was when it was established, and you know I haven't found anybody you know to tell me directly yet, but yeah, unfortunately the people that were alive back then that did it aren't around anymore. <laughs> right, but I understand the concept because right now a lot of people they look at that and they go my kids don't do sports or I don't have kids. So there's no need for me to get involved or think about it. But if you make it a park and you add trails, right. I like the idea of the benches and the exercising so that yep. there's other reasons for other members of the right. town to get involved. Right. Yes. That, that looks more appealing. That's what we're going for. <laughs> make yeah. it more of a community hub. Right. And not just, Hey, if you're into sports, that's it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, All right. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. I guess this with okay. unfinished business, we have none. Town managers report. The renovations on the first floor are mostly complete. Uh, Jay Lapierre, contractor, borough based contractor, did a fantastic job. Um, they got some painting to do and some of the clerk's stuff is still in the carpet room that needs to be moved, but um, looks great. I think it's just the beginning of work to be done downstairs, and it's really continuing a, a trend. We've been maintaining a lot of the town hall and, and, and doing a lot. Uh, one of the next projects, probably for the next fiscal year, is to look at rehabbing and renovating both the bathrooms. Yay! <laughs> um, on Public works and water. Jody is putting the final touches on some forms that we're updating that have some money attached to it, some bonds for um, when folks excavate on our roads. We want to make sure we have a bond and you know have things in place for just to make sure they do things the right way the first time. Um, I, I mentioned last meeting we're also working on transportation fees. Um, Going to have that hopefully for next meeting to discuss. Um, comprehensive planning is this Thursday. It's always on the second Thursday of the month at six o'clock. It's on Zoom right now. Um, Southern Maine Planning Development Commission is going to have a planner that's going to be dedicated to it. The goal is to get it uh, approved and finished in November 2022. We've just started putting in um, policies and, and action items. So to date, most of the work has just been inventorying what's going on. Um, we understand, we all have a huge desire to protect open space. You know, I'm not thrilled e either when I see pristine open space that is being developed in the, in the housing developments, um, but it's, it's allowed. And the only way to change that is to start with comprehensive planning and then we can amend our regulations and our ordinances. So like Tom said, get, in, get involved because there's, there's a whole host of tools. There's probably 50 to probably hundreds of tools at a municipality's disposal. It's just picking the, the package of tools that fits for Berwick. And uh, as we mentioned, there's um, a proposed expansion of Memorial Field. There's a survey done and that has been sent over to the Cormiers for, for review. So hopefully we'll have a response for them in the next couple of weeks, and that'll be back on the, the agenda. That, that's all I have for tonight. Any questions for James? If not, I'll move on. I had no communications. Is, um, that brings us to accounts payable. Payroll warrant number 20 for 
October 7th, 2021, for the amount of $69,775.07. We account payable warrant number 21 for October 12th, 2021, for the amount of $1,338,995.96. And we have a payroll warrant number 22. This is for October 14th of 2021 for the amount of $68,992. I'll make a motion that we pay our bills. Second. Second. Any discussion? If not, I'll go through the roll. Is Mark? Yes. Noah? Yes. Linda? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a yes. And under new business, I was told that we uh, skip in tabling the municipal valuation data. So we don't have all the correct information. So we have no quick claim deeds, no abatements. Second, public comment. No. Um, we will be going into an executive session. I just have one public comment. Okay. We have a public comment. Yes, we do. I just want to remind people that we're doing an open studio day, October 20th, and it's going to be from 5.30 to 7 p.m. here in this room, as well as in the studio. We'll have some lights out front with a nice little camera people can check out. So please stop by, ask us questions, find out what public access is. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to have an executive session, discussion of uh, publicly held property. Um, and under the other business and non-agenda items is uh, Linda would like to discuss uh, personnel policy. So if there is nothing else for anybody under other business and non-agenda items, I will make a motion that we go into executive session under Title I, subsection 405.6C for the discussion of disposition of publicly held property and I don't know the exact title for the discussion of personnel, but six A. Right. Six A. Yeah. So um, I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? A second. All right. Is um, before we go into the executive session, um, we are not planning on taking any formal votes Correct. during the session. This is more informational, so we will not be coming back into a public session afterwards. So um, I will go through the roll for the executive session. Mark? Yes. Noah? Yes. Linda? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself is a yes. We'll give everybody a chance to get things started. We'll get, wait for, uh, I, get, I keep saying, want to say BCTV, but it's not. It's not. BCM. It's B BCM. BCM, yeah. We'll wait for them to give us the thumbs up that we're all uh, good.